you know, you got to get patterns. So, so far, we've got the, the pattern that can stand up and just fly off, fly around in a circle and leave without really flapping their wings. They can fly 80 or 90 miles an hour straight forward uh, behind a pickup, terrifying people uh, out here in another little town. So that's a pattern that's beginning to form. They, they're of a lighter color, apparently, like a, like a moth, you know, gray or white. Um, and no one's got a real clear picture of their face yet. Uh, so apparently they, they say they have red eyes, so that's beginning to be a pattern. And red eyes aren't necessarily a sign of something supernatural. No. Because uh, certain animals have <clears throat> chemicals and crystals in their eyes, which when hit with the right light or that when they want to make them focus, you know, reflect back red light or yellow or green light. So that's, you know, cats can do that and they're not supernatural. Well, at least most people don't think so. <laughs> you know, one of the, the listeners that they, they needed to get a, a trace of DNA, you know, too bad that somebody didn't think about, or she didn't think about, you know, contacting somebody after hitting it where they could have swabbed the, you know, the, the, the bumper or the fender or whatever it was and see if they could have recovered any DNA from it. Yeah. And that's like a lot of things. They just, they don't think about it. It's like when people find Indian artifacts, they pick it up and brush it off and put it in their pocket. They don't take a picture of where it was, what the context of it was. They go home and shine it up with a brush and get rid of all the potential DNA that's been there for a long time and the uh, the uh, litho- lithograms that are, you know, the little grains of uh, silica that animals and our plants. Plants pick up a uh, little microscopic particle of silica, some of them. They arrange them in patterns, and then that's in their juices. So if that juice is cut into by a piece of flint, uh, they've been known to stay on there, these crystals, Stay on there in a pattern. So they can be looked at under a a powerful microscope, and they go, oh, yeah, that's that's yucca plant because that's the crystals they form, okay? So, but, you know, most people just don't think of stuff like that. There's so much information in front of us, we just don't know to collect it, you know, or we destroy it unwittingly. But um, eventually, you know, now that that's, uh, we're, we're closer, you know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, DNA wasn't available to anybody. I mean, you know, that was done by universities, but you couldn't get DNA. Now you get DNA on a, a stray dog. So it's it's coming around. There's more people have cameras now. They have dash cams. Uh, eventually someone may hit one with a dash cam going, you know. Uh, so there's certain potential in that, and that would tell a lot. Oh yeah, it would. And and I got to ask you another question. On this show and on this panel I was on this past Saturday morning and Sunday morning, they were talking to the scientist that was on was talking about like T-Rex. That actually T-Rex uh, the way it was created. Now you put the bones together and all that stuff. Basically, you know, they're labeled as this big killer and stuff like that. He claims that, or claimed that they could not really attack other di- dinosaurs because the way their structure is, they they couldn't do it. Uh, ha- have you ever thought about that? Well, I've heard those arguments. Uh, for sure, T. Rex has been from early discoveries. Uh, style is uh, the most fierce killing machine on earth. Well, that was an assumption because they found these giant heads and these uh, teeth that were twelve inches long six inches of which is generally embedded in the skull. And uh, the, the, the teeth are very strong. I didn't realize this until I began working with some of this stuff. Their teeth are strong enough that in the case of Stan, the one that's called Stan up in uh, South Dakota, he had broken one of his own teeth off or it had come loose, was a shed tooth or something, but he bit down on his own tooth and cut it in half. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So their teeth were very strong, although one of the sites we worked on called uh, Eagle Rex, there was a, a mesa just right there where we were digging, <clears throat> about a couple hundred feet away, and it had eroded into a shape that looked like an eagle, like an eagle head coming down to its shoulder. So we called the, uh, our T-Rex site E-Rex, Eagle Rex. You know, you always got to give them some kind of a cool name. But So we excavated this site. 
thinking, you know, I found a T-Rex tooth just coming out of the surface. I think it was about three inches long, which is pretty typical of a break. So, oh, man, we were energized. So we start doing the dig properly. You can't just get in there with a shovel and dig. You've got to dig with little blunt screwdrivers and blunt uh, cake decorating knives and that sort of thing and brushes and uh, collect this stuff, you know, systematically and record it and all that. In the jackets that we took out of there, we never did find the head. We didn't find any significant bones. What we found at so far, the count is 18 broken T-Rex teeth. They're from two and a half, two inches up to five inches long. And I'm thinking, how in the world can we have that many T-Rex teeth and no head? Well, maybe the head was already gone because of, you know, that, that skull might have been just five feet away. And within the last hundred years, that just eroded down the canyon. So we, we don't know. But um, the, the, the idea that they're the fiercest killing machine on Earth, that came from looking at these teeth. Well, you know, the, the, uh, a lot of people know that, you know, what the Bible says, that everything was created to eat herbs. And people go, well, that isn't true. T-Rexes, how could they eat? What would herbs would eat with those teeth? Well, the other day I was in the, um, uh, the grocery store in Lubbock, Texas, and here's this really weird-looking giant fruit as big as a watermelon. It's kind of a brownish gold, and it's got all these spikes all over it. And uh, I forget the name. It's like a dragon fruit or something. It smells kind of bad, but it tastes like chicken. <laughs> oh, wow. This thing would make three nice bites for a T-Rex. And I've tried to tell people, I say, look, these things have serrations on the, the, the back side of the teeth are serrated. And there's, uh, uh, and the front side is serrated. And then there's a third serration up near the gum, le- gum area for what I don't know. But I said, think about it. You know, this thing, if it bites another T-Rex or a, a, a triceratops skull, which they did, I've worked on uh, T-Rex uh, bones and skulls that have been obviously bitten by T-Rex, probably didn't kill them. You know, sometimes they're healed. So, but, so they apparently were attacking them. I doubt if they were playing. And <clears throat> uh, so, it looked, yeah, they obviously did eat meat. Like I say, Sue had eaten another T-Rex that was in her stomach. And we know they found the hadrosaur bones, you know, the big uh, duckbill dinosaur, where they were biting their feet off. And there, there's big gashes in their feet and in their skulls. But, you know, the Bible says they were meant to eat fruit originally and vegetation well here's this big fruit in the grocery store i've seen watermelons you know we that's a big deal out here uh coconuts so like okay these serrated teeth would do great and that thing would cut right through it but if it gets into a bone it's going to break them right so maybe those teeth aren't designed to eat meat uh like ours aren't really designed to eat meat we don't really have carnivore teeth we have uh vegetation teeth but we eat meat, you know. Uh, we chew up hard nuts and things and open Coke bottles with our teeth, which isn't smart. <laughs> but we're, you know, we're better off eating fruit as far as the teeth go. So a lot of the uh, early ideas about dinosaurs were, you know, it was their best guess, but they, they treat it like it's, a, like it's the law of God or something, you know. But these are just men trying to explain stuff they don't understand. <clears throat> but I'm not sure T-Rex was such a bad killer, uh, I think they like like coyote out here. If a coyote could get berries and cantaloupe, that's what they'd live on. Okay, well they're a carnivore. They got those teeth and everything. Surely they're just meat eaters. Well, not really. You know, uh, there are lions in uh, one of them in captivity that won't eat meat. He just eats vegetation. So uh, I, I may have told the story before. I'll tell it again though. Uh, in my opinion, and I think most people, a sheep and a horse are the two most herbivorous uh, vegetarians that you can find, right? They don't eat meat. They don't attack anything. No, you know. I know two two people that owned uh, really expensive Arabian horses, and they say, yeah, we got to keep away from the chickens because they'll stomp the chickens to death and eat them raw. I said, a horse? Oh, wow. Yeah, they eat the, the raw chicken. Well, you can tell they're carnivores because look at their flat teeth. 
<laughs> so I had some sheep one time. My daughters had a, a little, you know, we're out in a little country town here. So they had an FFA project where they, we bought some old sheep and they were going to raise them and, you know, I had a little project. So <clears throat> had a, some visitors one time and they, they brought some uh, pork bologna in and left it. And I don't eat pork. So after a few months, the bologna was bad. And I thought, well, I'm, I'll feed that to my cats. You know, they like all this stuff. So I threw it out. Guess who ate the bad pork? What ate the? It was my herbivorous, my herbivorous sheep. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you can tell they're carnivores because look at their flat teeth. So that's an assumption that you look at sharp teeth. You go, oh, that must be a carnivore. He evolved those teeth so he could chew up other animals. Well, not necessarily. That's just an assumption. And but once you see things like uh, what things actually really do eat. It, it changes the story. Who would think a horse would eat a, a, a live chicken? I would never you even know, thought I mean, that one. I mean, you know, because I got too many horses. And, you know, I, yeah, I, I will say one time, this is no joke, I was sitting there. We just went to McDonald's. We came back, or I, my wife came back from McDonald's, and we were working on the pasture, and she handed me a burger. And I, I hate a, a particular type of burger. And I just kind of like, I, I shouldn't have said it, but uh, I, I tossed it. And wouldn't you know it, one of the horses went right to it and consumed it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I just makes me wonder, well, what if you fed them steak and, and potatoes every day? What would, what, what would happen? Would they grow <laughs> sharp teeth that... or just get mean or get fat? I, I don't know. It's uh, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of assumptions in paleontology. And any other of the, of the cryptozoology, and dinosaurs are cryptids. We don't have one in a zoo yet. <clears throat> not that they're not still alive, but, you know, there's a lot we don't know. So they're still kind of very cryptic. They're hidden. And best guesses are not always right. What, what I take umbrage with with scientists, so-called scientists and paleontologists, is they, they make these statements, and it's like a law now that has to be adhered to in fact, you can't get your degree if you don't answer the questions the way they've stated their, the facts are. And then five years later, they say that isn't true anymore. It's like, well, okay, so give your degree back. If you're that wrong about all this stuff, you give your degree back <laughs> or quit making these, these, you know, these bold statements. Put a little if in there or a little maybe. You know, like the, as far as we know, T-Rex was a meat eater. So leave the door open to maybe he wasn't a meteor. Maybe he was a scavenger. That's maybe what I was, think. Uh, maybe he killed things, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, what they're trying to do, according to the scientists uh, this past weekend, is that they're taking some genes or DNA from chicken, and they're trying to actually, uh, with whatever some DNA they have recovered uh, from, you know, like uh, T-Rex, for example, and they're trying to create a, well, I, I don't see how they could actually create the original species, but they're trying to create this, like, you know, that, them two movies, you know, about, with all the dinosaurs and stuff. They're, they're, they're trying to bring back, you know, some of these extinct animals. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. They're going to create a bad chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe KFC might like them. Yeah, well, have, have you ever heard of... Uh... Uh, beefalo? No, I have not. Well, back in the 1890s or something, um, one of the old uh, trail drive guys out here decided he'd cre he cross buffalo and cow and see what he got. Well, we got beefalo. They're just a nasty buffalo. They're mean. They'll come after you. Uh, I think they finally kept breeding them, and now they've kind of got a beefy-looking beefalo that's half buffalo and half beef. <clears throat> but uh, all those hybrids, you know, you might get a hybrid. You get a hybrid between a dog and a coyote, and, um, you know, you put it back out in the wild, it probably won't last. It'll die off because they're not really meant to be. They're not a natural uh, species or a subspecies that's been created by man. Or, you know, sometimes that happens in the wild, but those usually don't go anywhere. You know, they're not the... They, they don't work very good. Hybrids are not a very good thing, you know, at least in the animal kingdom. <clears throat> and <clears throat> But there again, there are a lot of assumptions. There's uh, one of the things I've been, you know, hearing all my life 
is uh, survival of the fittest. 